for your time. If you find a wife, you can gladly take his time with from him. Um, but glad to be here, glad to uh, come with you. Thank you to Gideon and everyone who's organized this Reconcile Conference. Uh, it's an absolute privilege for me to be here. For those who don't know me, uh, I am Karsten Rembold. Um, easy way to remember, it is 10 cars, except the other way around. So hopefully that'll stick and, and, and come through. Uh, it's spelled the same way, so if you want to spell it, go for it. Um, but thanks, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, I come from Central Baptist Church in Pretoria, uh, and so we've traveled out here to be with you today. Uh, a bit of my crew in the front here, um, so hopefully they'll cheer and say amens as we go. Um, okay, starting off today, uh, where do I want to start? From 1948 to 1994 in this country existed a shameful period in South Africa's history. For those who can't put together this time, it is referred to as the apartheid era. I want to read and note what historian Kevin Giles says of this era. This theology, that is of apartheid, was backed by virtually every reformed theologian in South Africa. The unambiguous and overwhelming support of apartheid by the reformed churches justified and legitimated the system. One of their most respected theologians, F. Portkeeter, summed up what was believed. And listen carefully to what this guy has to say. He says, it is quite clear that no one can ever be a proponent or in favor of integration on the basis of the scriptures. It would be in a direct contradiction of the revealed will of God to plead for a commonality between whites, colored, and blacks. Further, the historian states that a missions policy in 1935, one of the most prominent churches in the Reformed Church group in South Africa read, the Afrikaner's traditional fear of equalization between black and white was born from his aversion to the idea of racial mixing. The church declares, and remember this is in their statement that they put forward as this church, the church declares straightforwardly opposed to this mixing and to everything that promotes. It, being the church, wishes to encourage and promote social differentiation and cultural segregation to the benefit of both sections. Why do I start here? We're not here to speak about race today. Um, that, that's Gideon's heart just took a flutter. Um, right? Why do I speak about this? Because on the basis of the scriptures, on the basis of what they read in the scriptures, the way they saw it, the way they read it, the way they looked at it, they thought racial segregation was to the benefit of white and black people. Why do I point to that today is because we need to check our own hearts before we come to this conversation. We can so easily come to this conversation and, and grab our Bibles and start swinging. We can come with our own views, our own ideals, our own thoughts and go, I just want to hear, does the speaker say what I think he needs to say? And if he disagrees with me, I'm going to swing at you with my Bible. What I want to rather say is we should take an attitude of humility. An attitude today that we come before God and we say, God, what do you have to say to us? God, where do you have to speak to us? What do your scriptures truthfully and honestly have to tell us today? And so my desire, and I'm sure that of the organizers, is that we wouldn't just come to affirm the views we already hold to, but that we would ask in humility, God, what do you in your word have to say to us? Why do I say this? Why do I point this out? Why do I start with something that seems so interrogating and antagonistic? is because when we come with our own ideas and views, we might be just as equally guilty of using the Bible to justify our views on homosexuality and gender equality as we can be of justifying abuse and domineering and demeaning leadership. We can so easily go off the spectrum on both sides if we are not careful to truly understand what God has to say to us in His Word. And so where I want to start today is a warning. If you've come here with a heart to, to swing your Bible, I would ask, put it down and read it. Let us ask what God has to say to us today. What then is my task? My task is to give you a vision of beauty. To say that God has created a magnificent, beautiful, perfect design. A design that allows both men and women to flourish, to live joyfully. But to be able to see this beauty, we need to be willing to put down our cultural and our experiential storylines and our glasses and to ask God, what do you want to say to us? And so in an attempt to do that, let us just open our, close our eyes 
uh, in prayer. Close our eyes. Not, Gideon's got in my mind. Um, <laughs> let's, let's close our eyes in prayer. Um, I want to ask you guys today, would you pray now in this moment, uh, firstly, just in your own hearts, uh, would you pray that God would give you a renewed vision, uh, that your heart would be open to hear what God has to say to you today and what God has to lead you towards? And then I want to ask you to pray for me. Pray that I would be beneficial to you, that I'd be useful, that I would speak only the truths found in Scripture, and that God would use me as a mighty instrument in His hands. Father, we want to come in, in, in absolute humility today, Lord. God, you know how easy it is for us to shape you into our mold and to shape our views into our mold. Lord, I pray that we would come and we would be conformed to what you desire for us. God, I pray that if any of us have come here today with a hard or aggressive heart or with our own views, that we'd be willing to set them aside and to listen. That, Father, we'd come desiring to hear what your voice has to say to us today. Would you open our minds, open our hearts. Lord, use me as an instrument, God. Help me to speak only your truth. In your precious name, Lord. Amen. And so the question at hand today is, is there a biblical design for manhood and womanhood? And if we would say that there is a biblical design, what does that look like? Okay, what does that mean? Why on earth would we add the term biblical? Why, why do we add that term? Why do we even mention that when we come to this topic? Because I certainly believe that when we come to answer this question, is there a biblical definition of manhood and womanhood? If we cannot answer the crucial question, what does that look like? Where does that come from? We will miss everything else, and you will miss everything that I have to say today. We come today and ask, what does the Bible have to say? And so that leads into my first question as we, we seek to ask what I think is the most important question of today. When we come to the topic of manhood and womanhood, who gets to decide? Who gets to decide? What do I mean by this? I mean, who defines what makes up a man and a woman? Who defines what roles they enact? Who defines what constitutes their being? We live in a culture that says, my body, my choice. Is that not what we come to today, that, that we should each be able to decide what makes up a man and a woman? It is my body, I should get to decide. Laverne Cox, an American actress and LGBTQ activist, had the following to say. She had to say, I think trans women and trans people in gender, in general, show everyone that you can define what it means to be a man or a woman on your own terms. A lot of what feminism is about is moving outside of roles and moving outside of expectations of who and what you're supposed to be to live a more authentic life. And so this is the current milieu, this is the current space that we live with as we go into our culture. Who gets to decide? I want to remind you that South Africa was the fifth country in the world to legalize gay marriage. This is a part of our culture. If you have not experienced it yet, you certainly will. It's flowing through our universities, it is flowing through our politics. And so I want to repeat the question again, who gets to decide? To answer that question, I've come with an illustration today. So I do some woodworking. So we've come through today. Um, and so I figured, like, I left my hammer at home. Um, unfortunately, I left it at home, so that's a bit of an unfortunate. But I have my phone. So, so what I can do is a phone sort of has a flat surface. It can sort of work. Uh, it, it'll go through. So, so if I go now, I want to just, oh, like, Oh my word, it's got a crack in it. How did that happen? How did that happen? How did I get a crack in my phone? Like surely it should have worked. Surely everything should have gone as it planned. It, it was flat, it was hard, it worked. Why did it fail? Why did it not serve the task that it came to bring? Because a phone is not a hammer, right? That might sound obvious to you. Okay, so the designer, when he came, and that's a Samsung, uh, if anyone wants it, you can claim it afterwards. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's a Samsung, and when they sat down, they designed, they thought, how is someone going to use it? They're going to spend their time, they're going to swipe, they're going to go on Instagram, going to WhatsApp, they're going to play some games, right? They were not expecting someone to go, I'm going to smash a nail in with it. 
and apologies if that went into the table. Um, <laughs> but they didn't expect that use, right? It was designed with a specific purpose, a specific intention in mind. And when I use that thing for a different purpose and a different intention, it leads to brokenness. Right? And so we need to ask that question, who gets to decide? Right? Should not the designer of the creation get to take into account how that creation is used? You see, Genesis 1 and 2, and we're going to come to the scriptures now, tells us, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 1 verse 26, God said, let us make man. 2.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 2.7, God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. 2.22, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from man and brought her to the man. You see, the Bible is absolutely, unequivocally clear. God is creator. God is creator. And if God is creator, then he gets to decide what a man and a woman is and how they should exercise what that looks like in their lives. In the same way that the Samsung creator decided that I couldn't use it as a hammer, God decides here is the good and right use. Yes, we come with our own experiences. Yes, we come with our own feelings. But in the end, no matter how much I felt that phone could be used as a hammer, it broke. Right? No matter how much I thought it would be a good idea, we need to ask the question, God, what have you created? How have you designed it? Where have you put it in place? And you know what's the awesome thing? The Bible tells us that we have a great and good creator. A creator who loves us, a creator who cares for us, a creator that longs for our great joy. And so he hasn't made a creation to stifle us. He hasn't made a creation to make us be set aside. He's created us for us to exist in joyful experience of him and what he has created. I think often we come at it with an attitude of like a child when you put them inside a, a, a little playground. And the child goes, but dad, I want to be out there with you. I want to be out there. I want to be playing with you. And it's like, man, you've got a swing. You've got a high pole. You can run. You can jump. You can do the monkey bars. But this, all this kid's doing is holding on the fence and going, but I want out, but I want out. Sometimes we just need to turn around and say, God, what is the good design you set before us? God has created us to enjoy, to flourish, to have life in what he's given us. Let's today see again what has he decided to go through. And so we come to a point of departure. Either at this point you're going to choose to accept what I've laid before you, and you're going to turn around and you're going to look at the swings and the monkey bars and you're going to say, what are these things? How do I use them in the right way that God has given them to me? Or you're going to depart in a different way and you're going to say, nope, Carsten, God doesn't get to decide. I get to decide. And at that point, uh, we will partially part ways. And so even though we live in a world that is broken, that is messed up, we need to ask the question, what has God designed? And we need to choose to make a choice to make are we, are we going to make God into our own image to fit into our picture of what we think the creation should be like? Or are we going to conform to God's image and what he has made and decided the way that we should use our sex and sexuality? And so if then God gets to decide, my second point for today is what has been decided? What has been decided? I first want to state again that God's design is good and perfect. What God has created is excellent. All the rest of the days when God creates, he looks at creation and he says, it is good. Except on the sixth day after he creates man and woman, he looks at everything he's created and he says in Genesis 1.31, it is very good. Very good. God marvels at his creation of men and women. He says, oh snap, look at this crazy thing that I created. Man, like the father's up there and he's like, hey Jesus, hey spirit, look at this. Look at this amazing thing we created, man and woman right? Created for us in our image. His design is without flaw or error. It is ordered, intentional, perfect, both in making mankind in general, but also in making man and woman specifically. And we want to travel and answer this question, what does this look like as we look through Genesis 1, 2, and 3? 
a reminder of biblical history, we are currently speaking of before the fall. In other words, what was God's design before sin entered into the world, before sin came and marred that image that we have? And so, as we look at this, what then is it that God has made? Or better, how has he made it? And so our first side point is God has created us in his image. Genesis 1 verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. You see, you're not a frog, you're not a lizard, you're not a dog, you're not a cat. As much as dog is man's best friend, dog is not a man, right? What makes you different from any of those things is that you have God's image upon you. That makes you completely and utterly distinct from any of those things. You as a human being alone in all of creation has God's image upon you. This does not mean that we are God, rather that we have an element of God's nature imprinted upon us. Before we address this, I want you to see the phrase, I want you to see God's heart in this. I want you to see God's heart in his design. I want you to notice there's a change of phrase. Everywhere else, God says, let there. In other words, let there be light, let there be sun and moon. When he comes to man, he says, let us make. There's this personal, intimate forming, this careful design put together by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. These are not the actions of a callous, of a cold, unfeeling God, but rather a personal, intimate God as he seeks to interact with his creation. So when we approach this, we should not look as God placing bounds of limitation upon us, but asking how do I exist under what my loving Father has put in place for me, for the promotion of my flourishing. So what does it mean to have God's image? Having God's image means that we are fashioned to resemble God on earth, to represent Him on earth. This is both mental, moral, and social likeness. And so anytime someone invents a machine, anytime someone writes a book, creates a cool design, enjoys some rap, passes math, or names a pet, when someone's disgusted by evil, praises good behavior, feels guilt, shame, hurt, every time someone marries, makes a friend, hugs a parent, or attends church, they're demonstrating the fact that they are made in the likeness of God. And so since the beginning of time, God has desired to bless us and to enjoy close fellowship with us. And for this reason, he made us like himself. I want you to realize, even as we come to this idea, that God has made us for a relationship. Okay, firstly, primarily God to ourselves, but also relationship between man and woman. I'm talking general here. That's how God's made us. We we see that God walked with man in the garden. We see that man, Adam himself, was seen to be alone. It was not good for him to be alone. And therefore God made him Eve. God has made us perfectly and good for relationship. And so though these are fractured and though these are broken, this design still holds true. Mankind, both male and female, are made with awesome dignity. I want to use the words immeasurably valuable. You see, I know a little girl called Abby, um, and Abby has Down syndrome. And so Abby's probably never going to win a marathon race. Abby's probably never going to win a Nobel Prize. Abby's most likely never going to be a Duck Scholar. But what God says about Abby is that she has infinite, immeasurable value and worth, not because of what she can provide to our society, but just because of the image that God places upon her. Right? And so when I come today, I want to start with that point. That's, that's what I want us to remember. When we have this discussion, and we're going to split into discussions of manhood, womanhood, what does this distinguishing factor look like? What unifies us together is so much greater, so much better, so much higher than what might differentiate us. God has created an awesome design. Our, our very being is valuable because of Him. Man or woman is not any less valuable. Why do I emphasize this? Um, it's because we're about to get to the spicy past. Uh, we're about to get to what does it look like to be a man and a woman? 
And what does that look like? What does the Bible tell us? And so as we come to this, I want to give a bit of a picture. Um, at least I'm hopefully younger than some of the people in this room. Uh, but I can remember sitting at home and we watched TV uh, back in those days. I can remember sh- the adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. First movie ever to come out in 3D for my knowledge, right? And so it just, I remember watching the movie in 2D and the second I put those glasses on, I was like, whoa. Like, like this is a whole new world. Like I know the movie, it's awesome, it's great. It's actually a terrible movie. It's like 20% of Rotten Tomatoes. But when you're 10, nothing matters, okay? But when I put those glasses on, that same movie just became so much more vivid, so much more life-giving. Why do I point to this? Because God did not just choose to make man and woman, humankind, and go, here it is. He said, I'm going to create great beauty in making them distinct. The same way that a diamond, as much as I might like looking at it a picture, when I turn it around my hand and I see the light coming through that in different ways, I see greater beauty in it. Okay, it's the reason why girls do not want plastic diamonds. Okay, they want the real thing. Okay, so what has God done? God's decided to create us, and so he distinguishes mankind. God creates us male and female. I want to read from Genesis chapter 2, verse 27 which says, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want to again show that distinguishing factor. In the image of God, he created him. That is the whole of mankind. Male and female, he created them. And so maybe if you've lost me, now's the time to wake up and focus, okay? You're going to need a bit of attention. We're going to go through a number of scriptures, and we're going to be flying around a bit, but but I want you to pay attention, okay? So God makes man and woman both in his image, but he creates man distinctively male, and he creates woman distinctively female, okay? We would say that both are made, again, as I've put together, because of the image of God, equal value, equal worth, equal dignity, but distinguished in their roles, Okay, I'm going to give you sort of an outline of what's the viewpoint, and then I'm going to give you all the scripture that backs it up. Where do we get this from? So here's the viewpoint. Okay, why do we care? Why do we care? Okay, so why do we care about the roles of male manhood and womanhood? Okay, that picture right there is why we care. Okay, because when we do not exercise the way that God has designed us and created us for our flourishing, for our joy, it always leads to brokenness, right? It always leads to falling short of what God's good design is. I was chatting with guys on the drive here, and the number one reason for crime, for low education statistics, for dropout rates, for almost anything you can point to is fatherless homes, Right? Why? Because it's outside of God's good design. And so we need to care about what God's good design is for manhood and womanhood. Secondly, why do we care about it? Because role is tied to nature. When we lose this distinguishing factor between what constitutes a man's responsibility and what constitutes a woman's responsibility, we begin to blur the lines. And as we blur the lines, we've seen very often in America, very easily, and even here in South Africa, very easy do we start losing that distinguishing factor and not even the physical begins to matter. If we don't care about the spiritual roles, soon the physical will very early follow it. We need to care about this. But most importantly, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, tells us that these distinct roles reflect Christ and the church. Why do I say most importantly? Um, Many of the catechisms start off with, what, what, what does it mean? Why do we exist? It's to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so as we come and we seek to exercise, we seek to ask this question, God, what does it mean for me to be a man in this world? What does it mean for me to be a woman in this world? We need to ask the question, God, what does it look like for me to glorify you? Yes, Ephesians chapter 5 is talking about marriage, but the whole time Paul says, when we come to this picture, we need to be modeling what it looks like in God's glorious design, and we're going to talk about redemption later, but God, Jesus Christ, coming to this earth, dying that he might pay the price for the church. And the Bible will tell us that the man is to exercise the role of Christ, sacrificially, sacrificially giving himself up. The woman is called to 
graciously and lovingly and caringly submit under that leadership. Why? Because that is what the church does to Christ. And so our main focus as we come to this is to say, God, how do I glorify you? How do I make much of what you are? How do I, in exercising my role, point the world to you? That should be central focus in our minds. I want to be clear, though, as we speak, that I'm going to speak principally. What what does this mean? Uh, The Bible is pretty clear in two areas, and that is uh, the church and family in terms of how do we order those things in manhood and womanhood. Outside of that, we really have to try and apply those principles. And so I'm not really going to go too much into those principles. We can get into a bit of that in the Q&A, into the application of those things. But I want to give you defining principles. What, what is it that we should look for? What is it that we should desire when we come to this topic? What is this principle then? I'm going to quote John Piper and Wayne Grudem. We are persuaded that the Bible teaches that only men should be pastors and elders. That is, men should, be, should bear the primary responsibility for Christ-like leadership and teaching in the church. So we believe it is unbiblical and therefore detrimental. This is in relation to the church, in relation to the home. We believe the Bible teaches that God intends the relationship between husband and wife to portray the relationship between Christ and his church. The husband is to model the loving sacrificial leadership of Christ, and the wife is to model the glad submission offered freely by the church. What does this mean? First, I want to look at headship. Headship is man's role to take primary responsibility for Christ-like, and I want to be every word makes a difference. Headship is man's primary role to take responsibility for Christ-like leadership, protection, and provision. That is the responsibility of man as we come specially towards the areas of home and the church, and we'll develop that outside of that. Then we come to the dreaded S word, submission. What does this mean? Okay. Okay. A wife or, or, or a church's divine calling, because we see that even the church is called to submit to the eldership, okay? The men are called to submit to the elders, okay? As are the women. What does it mean, submission? A, a wife's calling is to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. And remember, this applies the same way. Um, men also who are not elders in the church are called to submit unto the elders of the church. It's not a separate call um, in that right, but it's the same way women are uniquely called in that relationship. This is the point you might ask, Carsten, where did you get these views from? Okay, where on earth did you come to this, this idea? Surely as we look at society, we should think that women can do everything a man can do and a man can do everything a woman can do. Okay, you're just pulling this because it's your cultural view. I want to point to the scriptures and say, let's look there for our form and firm foundation. Reason number one, man was created first. So Genesis chapter two, they're in the, in the garden. God has created all of creation. Then he says, let us make man. So he goes and he forms man out of the dust. Okay, God could quite as easily in that moment have said, you know what, like man and woman are the same thing. Let me just take dust, ja, dust, ja, man, woman, poof. Okay, right, very easily he could have done that. But what God chooses to do is God says, chooses to set forth a pattern for us. And so what does he do? He creates man first. Okay? Then he says it's not good for man to be alone. And out of the rib of Adam, he creates Eve. Right? God creates Adam first to lead in that creative order, that he would lead in first responsibility of initiation and responsibility of leadership. So in this order of creation, we see the principle of male headship. Reason number two, man is given the moral pattern. So what does God do? He creates man out of the dust, poof, we get it, he's there. Okay, now we have man. What does God do? He says, here are the rules within my garden. Okay, here's the way you are to act. And so if we read from chapter 1, verse 16, 2, verse 16, it says, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. Well, why do I point to this? Is because at that point, woman is not yet created. Okay? Woman has not yet come onto the scene. It is just Adam. And God gives to Adam, here are the instructions of how you are to morally live. 
Okay, here's the instructions. We never read that God gives this instruction, this instruction to Eve. Okay, what's the assumption? The assumption is that Adam would teach Eve. Adam would exercise that authority. Adam would pass on that message to her as his, her head of that household. Okay, you might think, Carsten, you're, you're, you're pulling at straws, but I think we can see this more clearly when we come to reason number three. Reason number three, the man is grilled first. Okay, so we're going to go a bit into chapter three here. Chapter three, verse nine says, but the Lord God called Adam to the man and said to him, where are you? Adam, where are you? Verse 11, still interrogating Adam. He goes, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? How does this point as evidence? It says, God goes to the person that he gave the responsibility to act. Okay, same way, okay, if a child misbehaves, okay, you go to the parent and you go, how did you raise this child? Right, this is your responsibility as their authority, as their leadership role, to discipline, to instruct, okay? That's where we're called rightly to go. And so the same way God goes to Adam and he says, Adam, I'm holding you accountable. I'm going to you. I'm, I'm speaking to you as of first responsibility because it was your responsibility to pass this instruction down to Eve and to guard the moral pattern given in this garden. We do see, though, that Eve is still held accountable and Eve's not let off the hook, and we see that God does address her. But God looks first to the man, and he says, you're the spiritual leadership. Where were you? What did you do? Reason number four, woman as the helper. Uh, after this, we read in verse 18, this is chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. A couple of things here. First, I want to start with that term, helper. Um, we are not talking subservient as in like dismissive. She goes and washes the dishes and does these things and she cooks and I get to do what I want. Okay. We actually see in the scriptures that this term helper is more commonly used of God than it is of man. Okay, it's more commonly used to describe the nature of God and it's especially used in reference to Jesus Christ and to the Holy Spirit. Are we saying that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, is any less than the Father? No. We are saying that they exercise a specific role in the relationship. Okay, we're talking about the definition of what responsibilities do they have. We're certainly not talking about competence. Anyone here who has read Proverbs 31 knows that that woman is a boss. Like, that woman's an absolute boss. She sorts out the kids at home. She's busy planting a field. She's going out. She's knitting. She's giving to the poor. Like, that is not an incompetent woman by any means. By any means, right? She is a strong, empowered woman. But what does she do? In exercising her strength, in exercising those things, she has her husband alongside her. And she encourages him, and she walks along, and she is committed to helping him exercise his responsibility. Okay, role, that's what we're looking at. Rather, she is the perfect complement to assist him to accomplish the responsibility set apart from him. I, I want you to read again as we come back towards that idea that God says it's not good for man to be alone. There's a twofold understanding to that is yes, we're made relationally. It's, it, there's no one suitable in that space that's human. Like his dog just simply doesn't give him the affection he needs. But at the same time, God's perfect image, Christ and the church, could not have been displayed if it wasn't for man and woman, both adding their individual contributions to this. That as both come together, as both seek to act in their roles, there is this beautiful, perfect, grand, excellent design and picture that comes through of God. It's this picture we see in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, each of them exercising their roles, and as each lovingly exercises their roles, all equally God, all equally valuable, we get this amazing and perfect picture. Right? If Jesus Christ did not come to die, we would not be saved. Right? If the Father didn't send the Son, we wouldn't have the Son. If the Spirit didn't awaken our eyes to see the beauty of the gospel, we would not ever have had that. It is as Father, Son, and Spirit each acts in their roles, each acts in the way that they should act that we see God's glory on display. Reason number five, Satan attacks the woman first. Satan is truly crafty. 
Uh, he knows God's good design, and so what does he do? He seeks to reverse God's good order. Satan goes to Eve first to get to her. He says, you know what, if I can get her to take that responsibility of headship, if I can get man to be passive, to stand back, to not be interested. Remember, the scriptures are clear, Adam is with her, right? Adam is there beside her, but what does the snake do? What does the serpent do? What does Satan do? He goes to woman and he says, if I can get her to act outside of her God-given role, then I can get them to fall. Right, so he goes to Eve, he goes to the woman. God even emphasizes this in Genesis 3, 17. He says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. He says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. In other words, Adam, because you were passive, because you were listening, because you were taking in, because you were not exercising your spiritual role of headship, of leadership, of responsibility in that relationship, the ground will be cursed. A reminder of ordering. We see God's creation, man, woman, serpent, okay? Roles, not thinking value. What does the serpent do? The serpent goes serpent, woman, man. Reverses that order, completely flips it on its head. The question you might ask then is, how do we know that any of this original design matters? Like you've cast and you've gone through Genesis, it's Genesis, it's like age ago. Like why does any of this matter? It's because Paul clearly thought that it mattered. In his discussion on women exercising pastoral authority, he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. You see, all of this is, is based on the original order of creation. It is not based on some arbitrary cultural standard. It is not based on Paul's random feelings about men and women. He says, no, look to the created order. Look at how God made everything. And as we look at God's created order, we need to now enact in a way that is in kind. Okay? We're not just pulling this from nowhere. John Piper says, He's saying that there is something about the way that God set things up in the beginning that makes this kind of order good. In other words, true manhood and true womanhood mesh more effectively in ministry. They are better preserved and better nurtured and more fulfilled and more fruitful in this pattern of home and church than in any other pattern because God has made it this way. It is part of his gracious design for the good of men and women. None has greater value or worth or dignity, but both is the perfect complement to the other. And so what's in view? What's in view as I close? Um, I'm actually going to read this passage of Ephesians chapter 5 because I want to give you this great and glorious vision. Uh, Ephesians 5 is a picture of marriage. Uh, 5 from verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle in anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. And so our culture would say that, you know what, as you exercise to be a man, as you exercise to be a woman, it is repressive. It's holding you back. It's keeping you from being who you truly are. It's keeping you from feeling fully fulfilled as a person. What I want to say here is the Bible gives us such a perfect image. That, that as, as husband goes and seeks to serve in heartily, caringly, endearingly, lovingly, sacrificially, a reminder, Jesus Christ died for the church. That's the call upon the husband is, is to literally be willing to lay down his life for the sake of his wife. This is a man that loves his wife, cares for her, appreciates her. And therefore, what does he do? He takes the responsibility and given to him. He acts in loving, servant-hearted leadership. 
And then the wife, she looks to her husband, she says, man, this is a man worthy of respect. I'm going to come through and, and I'm going to serve. I'm going to encourage him. I'm going to push him to be the most godly man that he can be. I'm going to come under his leadership the same way that the church does. We in our church don't get to decide what we want to do. No, we look to God's word and we say, God has already decided, how do I fit into that picture? How do I fit in? Because I want to live to all that God has given me to live. And so the wife, as she looks to her husband, she says, I want to live the way God's given me to live. Right? I, I want to appreciate, I want to use the fullness of my gifts that God has given to me to be a blessing to this man as we seek to represent Christ in the church on earth. That the world would look at this, this relationship. And, and I guarantee you, I heard a statement a while ago and I told it to the guys in the car, is if, if any strong feminist had to go into that sort of home where the husband is sacrificially, servant heartedly serving his wife and taking up that role of leadership and the wife is going and she says, man, this is a, my, my role and responsibility to encourage him, to use my giftings, to help him to exercise his leadership. There is no way you're going to convince that couple that something's wrong. There's no way. Why? Because there's joy, there's fruitfulness, there's flourishing, there's safety to be found in that space. This is God's beautiful, perfect, grand, excellent design for us. And so what I want us to leave with from this talk, what I want us to consider, what I want us to, to really come through is, is I don't want to come here and say, you know what, like Carson said, here's the Bible, bash, I need to be a man, I need to be a woman. What I want to say is God is something good for you. God is something right, joyful, precious. Let's seek to pursue that. Let's seek to honor that, that we might live to the fullness of all that God has for us. Let, let me pray. Father, I'm just grateful that we gave your word. I'm grateful that, God, you speak to us, that, God, you, you have shown us such riches and blessing. Lord, thank you that you have created a marvelous design that we might walk and live in, and, Lord, we know it is so messed up as we're going to hear but God, would you help each of us to ask that question, God? Would, how, how does it look like for me to live as a man or for me to live as a woman in this world? How does it look like for me, God, to serve you, to love you? How does it look like for me not to abdicate, to leave my role as a, as, as a husband or as a man, but to rather love and to serve? How does it look like for me as a woman to to come and to, to willingly submit, to, to willingly use the fullness of my gifts in your service, God, in the ways that you've called me to do so. God, I pray as we come even in all things, we be reminded that you, Christ, humbled yourself to the point of a death on a cross for our sake. That God, even as we come to this picture, that you are so good and gracious. In so many areas that we fall short, in so many areas that we miss the mark, God, we be remembered and reminded that, God, you loved us so much as to save us. And would that be our foundation even as we look to continue on to the rest of today, Lord? In your precious name, amen. Once more.